So we're going to start with GI surgery test and discussion now and we're going to start with upper GI that is esophagus and stomach. So let's start with the questions regarding esophagus. Majority of the questions from GIT are being asked from esophagus, bowel obstruction. Those are the commonly asked topics. So we'll focus more on esophagus, stomach and bowel obstruction. A baby playing unsupervised complains of difficulty in swallowing since the last few hours. An x-ray is done. What is the diagnosis here? So they are asking for the diagnosis in this patient. So as you can see in the x-ray, you can see that there is some air shadow ahead of the stone and that is the trachea that is the trachea and behind the trachea is the esophagus so the stone is in the the coin is in the esophagus so there is a foreign body in the esophagus and b is the correct answer a five-year-old child swallows a button battery on investigation it is found to be in the stomach this question has been asked many times in the aims exam that if it's a button battery even if it is asymptomatic you should do endoscopic removal in fact last year they had shown an x-ray for this and the answer was endoscopic removal Another child swallows a coin and x-ray finds it to be lodged at the pharyngeoesophageal junction. Now the pharyngeoesophageal junction is the narrowest portion of the GIT, right? And if a coin is lodged there, that means it is unlikely to travel down and that also needs to be removed using endoscopy. So you know that there are three primary constrictions in the esophagus. They are 15, 25 and 40 centimeters from the upper incisor. 15 centimeters is the pharyngeoesophageal junction which is the narrowest portion of the GIT. And as I've told you, if something is stuck there, it needs to be endoscopically removed. 25 centimeters is the arch of aorta and the left main stem bronchus and 40 centimeters is the diaphragmatic opening. So that these are the three constrictions where foreign bodies can get lodged. Which of the following statements is not true regarding corrosive esophageal injuries? Co alkali injuries are more severe than acid injuries. This is true because alkalis can penetrate further. Acids cause more gastric damage due to pylorospasm. This is very important because they cause pylorospasm acids cause more gastric damage as compared to esophageal damage. Endoscopy should be delayed for a few days. This is false. The best thing is to do an early endoscopy which tells us about the extent of the problem and we can outline the management. So early skilled endoscopy is of paramount importance in a patient with corrosive esophageal injury. Prophylactic antibiotics have not shown to improve survival. This is true. A healthy patient undergoes a diagnostic endoscopy and starts complaining of chest pain two hours after the procedure. Within five to six hours, he develops low-grade fever, but the vitals are stable. Which of the following statements is not correct regarding the management of this patient? So what has happened to this patient is probably an iatrogenic perforation where after endoscopy there has been a perforation. CCT is the investigation of choice. This is true because the vitals are stable. Because the vitals are stable. Patient can be managed conservatively with bowel rest and antibiotics. This is true. Immediate surgery should be done. This is False, because the patient is stable, the patient might not require surgery. Repeat endoscopy should be carried out to rule out internal bleeding, right? So, this is also false. We do, shouldn't do a repeat endoscopy. So, these are the two statements which are correct. Immediate surgery should only be done if the patient is not improving on conservative management. That's when immediate surgery should be done. A 35-year-old alcoholic patient develops sudden chest pain after a bout of retching and vomiting. When he presents to the emergency, his pulse rate is the tachycardia and blood pressure is 100 by 70. On auscultation, there is decreased air entry on the left side and a crunching sound is heard on auscultating the heart. 
He is diagnosed with Boerhaave syndrome. Boerhaave syndrome is spontaneous esophageal perforation. Which of the following is not a component of Mackler's triad seen in this condition? So, there is chest pain, retching and subcutane subcutaneous emphysema. This makes up Mackler's triad. What is not there in Mackler's triad is fever. Fever is not a component and this crunching sound which you hear is known as Hammond's crunch is known as Hammond's crunch which is a crunching sound which is heard on auscultation. Right? You can even see a left sided pleural effusion. You can see a left sided pleural effusion in these patients as well because the perforation usually occurs in the lower left, lower posterolateral wall on the left side lower posterolateral left side wall is what perforates. So, spontaneous perforation Boerhaave like I have told you left posterolateral wall, I have told you about Mackler's triad and Hammond's crunch and I have also told you about the management of a patient with an iatrogenic perforation where majority can be managed using conservative means. Which of the following is not true regarding tracheoesophageal fistulae? Proximal blind ending and distal communicating with the trachea is the most common. This is true. This is type C. Flourish device can be used for type A, that is atresia, that is correct. Flourish is when magnetic rings are put on both the sides. Watterson criteria takes into account birth weight and pneumonia. This is also true. And anterolateral thoracotomy approach is used. This is false. It is a posterolateral thoracotomy, posterolateral thoracotomy approach which is used in these patients. So, type C is the most common. Type C is when the upper end is blind ending, the distal end communicates with the trachea. Type A is atresia and type E is also known as the H type where the esophagus is patent but still there is a fistulous communication between the esophagus and the trachea. GERD, true and false, 24 hour pH monitoring is the investigation of choice. So, 24 hour pH monitoring is the gold standard investigation, right, is the gold standard investigation. The investigation of choice for gastroesophageal reflux disease is endoscopy. The MISA score of more than 14.2 represents GRD, that is correct. pH probe is kept 5 cm proximal to the G junction, that is also correct. And all patients require surgical management, that is false. So, which of the following statements is not true regarding the management of GRD? Endoscopic RFA has shown good long term results in the management of GERD. This is true. This is a statement directly from the latest Bailey where they have seen that endoscopic RFA has shown long term results. Lynx device uses magnetic beads around the lower esophageal sphincter for the management of GERD. That is true. Gas bloat syndrome is the most common complication of fundoplication. True and minimum 1.5 cm length of intra-abdominal esophagus should be achieved while doing fundoplication. This is false. It should be at least 2 cm length. It should be at least 2 cm length which we should try to achieve. So, Nissen's is a 360 degree wrap and gas bloat syndrome is the most common complication following it. Door is 180 degree anterior. Toupe is 180 to 270 degree posterior, Belsay mark is 270 degree anterior and Lynx is when you have magnetic beads which are put around the lower esophageal sphincter. Identify the procedure shown in the image. This is a Coley's gastroplasty which is done if to increase the length of the esophagus, to increase the length of esophagus. This is done when there is shortening of the esophagus, that is when we do Coley's gastroplasty. All of the following patients are good candidates for anti-reflux surgery except.
a 31 year old male with typical GERD with disease becoming resistant to medical therapy. This is true. If it's becoming resistant to medical therapy, we need to carry out surgery. A 55 year old woman with disease well controlled with proton pump inhibitors who wishes to discontinue medical therapy. True. She wants to discontinue medical therapy. So if she's going to have symptoms again. You will have to do surgery. A 75 year old male with new onset heartburn and weight loss which is not relieved by PPIs. Now, these are symptoms of cancer and a patient with suspected cancer will not benefit from anti-reflux surgery, right? You, what he needs is an endoscopy and a biopsy. So, this is false. And a 52-year-old man with volume reflux and a large paraesophageal hernia, this is true. This is true. You know, this is Barrett's esophagus. Barrett's esophagus is specialized intestinal metaplasia when you have columnar cells which are there and Barrett's esophagus, the pathognomic finding is to find goblet cells on biopsy and if it's classical, you can see this red velvety mucosa. Chromoendoscopy can be done in Barrett's when there is microscopic Barrett's or very small Barrett's which you cannot make out with the naked eye, you can do a chromoendoscopy and that highlights the mucosa at risk or the abnormal mucosa from which you can take a biopsy. A 56 year old CEO is diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus after a long history of GERD. He visits you to understand the disease. All of the following statements are correct except he requires a two-yearly endoscopic surveillance with multiple biopsies each time. This is true. This is the way we manage. This is the way we monitor Barrett's and this is known as the Seattle protocol. This is known as the Seattle protocol. If high-grade dysplasia is detected, then esophagectomy is required. If high-grade dysplasia is detected, we move to three monthly scans. This is false. In low-grade dysplasia, endoscopic duration should be reduced to 6 months, scopies with ablation of abnormal mucosa, this is true. Lifestyle changes should be recommended to this patient in addition to control drugs to control reflux, that is also correct. This is the Seattle protocol which I was talking about, which is used. Two-yearly endoscopic surveillance protocol is done. If it's Barrett's, we continue endoscopic surveillance. If it's a low-grade dysplasia, we have to do photodynamic therapy to ablate the mucosa and continue six monthly scopies. If it's high-grade dysplasia, we ablate the mucosa, move to three monthly scopies. If it's cancer, we will carry out esophagectomy. A patient is incidentally detected with a sliding hiatal hernia during a research study. She is asymptomatic but is really concerned about her condition and visits you for advice. Which of the following statements is correct regarding her condition? She should be offered immediate fundoplication, right? No, asymptomatic sliding hiatal hernias don't classify for fundoplication. So, asymptomatic sliding hiatal hernias, you'll wait and watch. This is false. She should be told that it is a life-threatening condition which can lead to necrosis of the herniated portion. This is false. This happens in rolling hiatal hernias. Patient should be reassured about her condition and told that there is no active surgical intervention required right now. This is true. Endoscopic biopsy should be done in case to rule out cancer. False. There are no features suggestive of cancer in this. So, this is a sliding hiatal hernia. Sliding hiatal hernia is when the GE junction migrates. So, the GE junction moves proximally. The GE junction moves proximally. That is a sliding hiatal hernia. Only symptomatic cases require, only symptomatic cases will require surgery. Otherwise, they don't require surgery. Rolling hiatal hernia can be life-threatening. This is when a portion of the stomach herniates through the hiatal opening. 
This is also known as a paraesophageal hernia and all patients require surgery. All patients, you need to do surgery and the stomach can undergo volvulus and can undergo necrosis as well. So this is another example of a rolling hiatal hernia. This was asked a few years back in one of the exams. One more thing regarding hiatal hernias, an update in Bailey, which you should know, hiatal hernias, CT with oral contrast is the investigation of choice for hiatal hernias. It is no longer a barium swallow. This is what is written in Bailey and you should follow that, that it is CT with oral contrast, which is the investigation of choice. A question asked in a recent exam, a very easy one, Killian's dehiscence is a potential space between the cricopharyngeus and the thyropharyngeus, these are both parts of the inferior constrictor muscle. So, Killian's dehiscence is the potential space between cricopharyngeus and thyropharyngeus and you know that through this can come out Zenker's diverticulum. Through this can come out Zenker's diverticulum. Zenker's diverticulum you know is a false diverticulum or a pulsion diverticulum. This is what it looks like, a Zenker's diverticulum. It starts in the midline posteriorly and finally comes to lie in the left of the midline. So, starts in the midline posteriorly, comes to lie on the left side of the midline. The earliest clinical feature is regurgitation. So, regurgitation is the earliest symptom. The most common complication is aspiration pneumonitis. So, aspiration pneumonitis. Which of the following is a true diverticulum of the esophagus? Zenkers, I've told you, is not true. It's a false diverticulum. Hypopharyngeal is not true. Epiphrenic is not true. It is the mid-esophageal diverticulum, which is a type of a traction diverticulum, which can be seen in tuberculosis and histoplasmosis. And this involves all the layers of the esophagus unlike a false diverticulum like a Zenker's diverticulum. Zenker's is a true diverticulum, false, it is an example of a pulsion diverticulum, true, we've discussed this, final position is left of midline, this we've discussed. Dysphagia is not the earliest symptom, it is regurgitation which I've told you. Aspiration pneumonitis is the most common complication, this is true. Investigation of choice is endoscopy. This is false. It is a barium swallow. And Dolman's procedure is endoscopic diverticulopexy with cricopharyngeal myotomy. This is true. So, these are the, some of the points which you should know regarding Zenker's diverticulum. A Shatsky's ring can cause intermittent dysphagia. So, in the question stem, please read out for, please read for intermittent dysphagia, which can be there. This is a mucosal or a submucosal ring known as the B ring. Only if it is symptomatic, then we will do a balloon dilatation. You will do balloon dilatation for a symptomatic Shatsky ring. So, what is the diagnosis based on the barium swallow image? You can see this is the typical diagnosis of cox screw esophagus, which is seen in diffuse esophageal spasm. This is seen in diffuse es esophageal spasm. Now, the name has been changed to distal esophageal spasm. According to the latest Chicago classification, it is now known as distal esophageal spasm rather than diffuse esophageal spasm. A 25-year-old female presents with dysphagia. Barium swallow image is shown below. What is the diagnosis? So, this is the typical diagnosis of achalasia cardia where you have a bird's beak appearance and why isn't this cancer? You should know that cancer is going to have a rat tail appearance and irregular margins whereas gradual tapering is bird's beak appearance. Gradual tapering is bird's beak appearance. In which of the following motility disorders is normal peristalsis not seen? So, normal peristalsis is not seen in achalasia cardia. In achalasia cardia, the lower part of the esophagus does not show normal peristalsis and there is abnormality in the lower esophageal sphincter as well, which fails to relax. Rest of them, they will show normal peristalsis. 
Chicago classification, the updated one is mentioned in Bailey, which is not true regarding Chicago classification. Classification is based only on readings obtained by classical manometry. This is false. They are based on readings by high resolution manometry. So, the latest Chicago classification is based on high resolution manometry rather than classical manometry. Type 3 is spastic achalasia. This is true. It divides achalasia into four types. This is false. And DCI in Chicago classification measures the pressure of the lower esophageal sphincter. This is also false. DCI is distal contractile index. And you can see here, distal contractile index is measures the strength of distal esophageal contraction and not of the lower esophageal sphincter. So, distal contractile index is not for lower esophageal sphincter. It measures the strength of the distal esophageal contraction. IRP is integrated relaxation pressure. An elevated IRP above normal lack, defines lack of lower esophageal sphincter relaxation seen in achalasia. Right. So, an elevated IRP will be seen in achalasia. A 35 year old lady suspected to have achalasia is subjected to high resolution manometry. On manometry, no normal peristalsis is seen in the lower half. Premature spastic contractions are seen with a DCI of more than 450. So, we have discussed that no normal contractions in the lower part of the esophagus in achalasia and the DCI will be raised there. So, spastic achalasia, I was telling you, spastic achalasia is classically type 3 achalasia which I had mentioned previously as well. So, type 3 is the correct answer here. Algrove syndrome is also known as triple A syndrome and in this you have achalasia, alacrimia, and ACTH resistant adrenocortical insufficiency. So, that is Algrove syndrome for you, which you should know for your exam. A patient complains, another question regarding motility disorders, a patient complains of crushing sub uh, chest pain which radiates to the jaw along with dysphagia. Sublingual nitroglycerin provides him relief. He underwent manometry which shows simultaneous high peak contractions of high amplitude more than 120 millimeters of mercury. So, this chest pain getting relieved by nitroglycerin but the ECG remaining normal are classical classical features of distal esophageal spasm or diffuse esophageal spasm as it was previously called. This is POEM. This is one of the techniques to deal with achalasia. POEM stands for per oral endoscopic myotomy. Per oral endoscopic myotomy. This is a type of a notes procedure that means a natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery procedure, a natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery procedure. This I have already explained to you. This was the previous Chicago classification given in the old Bailey where they had told about nutcracker esophagus and diffuse esophageal spasm which I have already told you presents as chest pain which is relieved by nitroglycerin but the ECG is normal. A patient is recently diagnosed with adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. The tumor is present in the distal esophagus within 1 to 5 centimeters above the GE junction. According to the Sivert's classification, which type does the tumor belong to? So, this is the Sivert's classification. You can see here 5 centimeters to 1 centimeter proximal is type 1, 1 centimeter proximal to 2 centimeter distal is type 2 and 2 cm distal to 5 cm distal is type 3. So, according to this question, it is proximal to the GE junction. So, this will be a type 1 GE junction tumor or type 1 Sivert's cancer, which is basically treated like a lower esophageal cancer, right? So, the surgery here will be an esophagectomy. To manage this, you will treat it like a lower esophageal tumor. 
Which of the following is not true regarding the staging of GE junction tumors? Sivert's type 1 extends 5 cm proximal till 1 cm proximal. This we've just discussed is true. Sivert's type 1 and 2 are treated as esophageal cancers. This is true. A total gastrectomy should be done for type 3 GE junction tumors. True. And proximal margin for type 2 tumors should be 5 cm. So, proximal margin should be at least 10 cm for G junction tumors uh, for esophagectomy you should have at least that margin. So this is the latest uh, cancers of the gastroesophagic junction that have epicenters within 2 centimeters proximal of the gastric cardia are treated as esophageal cancer right. So these are treated 1 and 2 are treated as esophageal cancers whereas those with epicenters more than 2 centimeters distal to the GE junction are staged as gastric cancers. These are the three types of surgeries which are there for esophageal cancers. You have Oringer's or transiatal esophagectomy, Ivor Lewis esophagectomy or McCune or three field esophagectomies. What is the blood supply of the conduit used in gastric pull up surgery during esophagectomy? So during esophagectomy we bring up the gastric tube right and that is the most so stomach is the most common uh, esophageal replacement and this gastric tube is based on the right gastric and the right gastroepiploic arteries this has been asked in the AIMS exam and previously in the PGI exam as well so you should know about this. What is the most common complication of a self expanding metallic stent used in advanced cases of carcinoma esophagus? So, SEMS that is self expanding metallic stent is used when there is a malignant tracheoesophageal fistula. When there is a malignant tracheoesophageal fistula, this is what we use, and migration of the stent is the most common problem in patients where this SEMS is used. So, these esophageal infections, a lot of common questions are being asked in CMV, these you should know CMV, you will get serpinginous or geographical ulcers, herpes, you get small ulcers with raised margins, candida, you will get a worm like esophagus, GERD, you can get feline esophagus, feline esophagus can also be seen in eosinophilic esophagitis in eosinophilic esophagitis but it is more common in patients with GERD. Cancer you see rat tail appearance and achalasia you will get bird's beak appearance. So this is a stacked up appearance of feline esophagus which can be seen in both eosinophilic esophagitis and in GERD but it is more common in GERD. This is an INICET type of a question which was asked. A 40 year old female presents with progressive dysphagia for both solids and liquids since the last 6 months. Her BMI is 18.5 without any systemic illness. Barium swallow image is shown below. What should it be? So, there are typical features which are present of achalasia, but she's also started losing weight and progressive dysphagia is there. So, you also want to rule out cancer because in long-standing achalasia, you can even get squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus. So, the investigations which you would want to do here would be upper GI endoscopy to rule out a cancer and to carry out manometry. Those would be the investigations required in this patient. So, that brings us to the end of the questions regarding esophagus. Now, we are going to talk about stomach, bariatric surgery and GI bleeds. So, the first question which is been asked many times that is regarding the metabolic abnormality seen in idiopathic hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So, you have a male child with repetitive vomiting diagnosed with idiopathic hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. What is the metabolic finding? The metabolic finding which you find here is hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. You know that HCl which is there in the stomach. So, the hydrochloric acid which is there in the stomach that is going to be vomited out. So, there is going to be decrease in hydrogen ions that is metabolic alkalosis, decrease in chloride ions. And why hypokalemia? Because there is sodium loss as well and to compensate for that 
potassium is thrown out of the system so there is hypochloremic hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis which is there with paradoxical aciduria so gastric outlet obstruction in a idiopathic hypertrophic pyloric stenosis patient is asymptomatic at birth uh, usually present with features after 2 to 3 weeks and it is projectile non bilious vomiting which is seen here and because the vomiting is non bilious that is how we can differentiate it from duodenal atresia now another question which has been asked that the best time to examine the child is when the child is feeding and during feeding you will feel an olive shaped lump in the epigastrium you will also see visible peristalsis going from left to right and it is followed by vomiting the investigation of choice is ultrasound and a pyloric length channel length of more than 16 and thickness of more than 4 mm is diagnostic i've already discussed the metabolic abnormality with you the fluid of choice is n by 2 normal saline with dextrose and kcl and kcl should be added when KFT kidney function test is normal or urine output is adequate that's when we should start potassium replacement so first born male childs are more commonly affected and another important update especially for the INICT exam there is reduced level of neuronal nitric oxide synthase has been found in these patients the associations are trisomy 18 apert syndrome and cornelia de lang syndrome Maternal erythromycin intake has also been associated with idiopathic hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. You have a five week old male child who is brought to the emergency with multiple episodes of non bilious vomiting. Identify the barium in image and diagnose the condition. So, this is also of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. There are certain signs which you can see on barium as well. These signs are the string sign. The string sign you can even see in inflammatory bowel disease. This is string sign, double track sign and mushroom sign. So, there are three signs, string sign, double track sign and mushroom sign which you can see on a barium image in idiopathic hypertrophic pyloric stenosis and this question was asked in the FMG exam. So, you should know about these findings as well. A male patient presented to the OPD with an abdominal lump in the periumbilical region which moves at right angles to the attachment of the mesentery. What is the most likely diagnosis? So, the correct answer here is a mesenteric cyst, is a mesenteric cyst and for a mesenteric cyst, the most common is a chylolymphatic cyst. Now, suddenly off late in the last two years, this mesenteric cyst has assumed a lot of importance and almost every examiner is asking questions from this. Mesenteric cyst, you should know the Tillox triad. The Tillox triad is that you will have a periumbilical lump which is there. This lump moves at right angles to the attachment of mesentery and this finding that it moves at right angles is known as the Tillox sign is known as the Tillox sign so which moves at right angles to the attachment of mesentery that is Tillox sign and there is a transverse band of resonance which can be percussed. The investigation of choice is CECT and the management is surgery. Chylolymphatic cysts are the most common and chylolymphatic cysts because they have independent blood supply that is why enucleation can be done for chylolymphatic cysts. Enterogenous cysts on the other hand there is sequestered bowel tissue which shares its blood supply with the bowel and in this case we, I cannot enucleate the cyst I have to carry out a resection and anastomosis. So for enterogenous cyst we have to do a resection and anastomosis. What is the most common site for a gastric ulcer? Now, mind you, please don't get confused with a duodenal ulcer. Duodenal ulcer is the first part of duodenum. For a gastric ulcer, it is the lesser curvature near the incisura. Lesser curvature near the incisura and you have a Johnson's classification for gastric ulcers. Before we talk about the Johnson's classification, another question which you should know for the exam which gastric ulcers are associated with increased acid secretion? You know that duodenal ulcers, 
duodenal ulcers are associated with increased acid secretion and because duodenal ulcers are associated with increased acid secretion they respond to vigotomy they respond to vigotomy or acid reducing surgery they respond to that but not all gastric ulcers respond to vigotomy because they are not because of increased acid secretion so only two are because of increased acid secretion that is type 2 and type 3 and they are the ones which are going to respond to vigotomy or acid reducing surgery so like i said there is a johnson's classification for gastric ulcers type 1 gastric ulcers are the most common type this question has been asked they are along the lesser curvature close to the incisura angularis type 2 is a prepyloric plus a duodenal ulcer type 3 is only a prepyloric ulcer and type 4 is an ulcer high up in the body of the stomach so type 2 and type 3 are the ones which are associated with acid hypersecretion they are associated with acid hypersecretion and they respond to vigotomy type 4 is along the body and these are the ones which bleed most commonly they are the ones which bleed most commonly and again don't get confused the most common vessel which bleeds in peptic ulcers or duodenal ulcers you know because why am i saying peptic because duodenal ulcers are more common uh, peptic ulcers than gastric ulcers so the most common vessel involved is the gastroduodenal artery but if they ask which is the most common vessel for a bleeding gastric ulcer if they specify gastric ulcer then it is type 4 ones which bleed and it is the left gastric artery it is the left gastric artery which is implicated let's review the following statements regarding peptic ulcers most common vessel implicated in the in bleeding is gastroduodenal artery this i just told you this is true perforation is the most common complication of gastric ulcers that is true for duodenal ulcers the most common complication is bleeding which comes out as upper gi hemorrhage but for stomach ulcers for gastric ulcers it is perforation most common vessel implicated in the bleeding of peptic ulcers is left gastric artery this is false this is gastric ulcer type 4 gastric ulcers bleed most commonly this is true only type 3 gastric ulcers respond to vigotomy and acid secretion this is false it is 2 and 3 it is 2 and 3 so 1 2 and 4 are the correct statements this is your typical ini ct type of question which of the following symbols represents the surgery which has least vigotomy related complications so you can see in the image that vagus has been marked and i can't i don't know if you can see clearly this is a this is b this one is c so there are three different types of vigotomies now a is truncal vigotomy where you are cutting the trunk of the vagus B is selective vigotomy and C is highly selective vigotomy. Now, truncal vigotomy plus antrectomy has maximum acid reduction. There is maximum acid reduction, but there are maximum complications as well because you are cutting the trunk of the vagus. There are maximum complications as well. Highly selective vigotomy, on the other hand, has least vigotomy related complications. Has least vigotomy complications. So, that is why the correct answer here is going to be a C that is highly selective vigotomy. You know, these days surgical vigotomy is rarely being done because proton pump inhibitors have such a good result that it is equivalent to a vigotomy. 
this is about the branches of the vagus uh, which you know about one thing which i would like to highlight here is the criminal nerve of grassi this criminal nerve of grassi is the one which is responsible for ulcer recurrence after vagotomy so this is the nerve which usually gets left behind and this is the one responsible for ulcer recurrence after vagotomy a patient underwent a total gastrectomy few months ago what is the most common metabolic complication expected in this patient so you know the most common metabolic complication is iron deficiency anemia iron deficiency anemia is the most common metabolic complication after gastrectomy vitamin b12 deficiency and osteoporosis can also occur but the most common is iron deficiency anemia this is a very important question asked almost every alternate here a 26 year old male patient was brought to the emergency department with abdominal pain and obstipation for the last 3 days he gives a history of a bull gore to the abdomen 3 days back so he had a injury to the abdomen and since 3 days there has been abdominal pain and obstipation x ray is shown below now the confusing term here is obstipation because of obstipation you will think that this can be bowel obstruction but if you look carefully in the x ray you can see the diaphragm you can see the diaphragm and you can see gas below the diaphragm you can see air under the diaphragm and you know you know that air under the diaphragm is seen in patients with hollow viscous perforation it is seen in patients with hollow viscous perforation another x ray representing the same thing with a slightly different history that you have history of nsaid consumption patient presents to the emergency with severe abdominal pain has tachycardia hypotension and rebound tenderness x ray again the same finding of gas under diaphragm the answer is going to be there's a hollow viscous perforation and when you have hollow viscous perforation you resuscitate the patient and you go in for immediate laparotomy regarding complications of vagotomy and gastric reconstruction true and false iron deficiency is the most common nutritional deficiency this i've already told you is true duodenal blowout that means if you're closing the stump of the duodenum that would usually open up on day 6 this usually op opens up on day 4 day 6 is when burst abdomen can occur in the abdomen but a duodenal stump usually opens up on day 4 stemmer's hernia is hernia under the rulum this is true cholelithiasis can develop after highly selective vagotomy so this is false cholelithiasis can develop after truncal vagotomy but not after highly selective vagotomy so this can occur after truncal vagotomy but not highly selective vagotomy retrograde intussusception can be seen in patients following ru and y gastrojejunostomy this is also a true statement which of the following is not true regarding dumping syndrome you know dumping syndrome is also one of the vagotomy related complications and there are two types of dumping syndromes you have early dumping and you have late dumping sugar rich fluid should be avoided along with meals in patients with dumping syndrome this is true because this can worsen the findings of dumping right this can worsen the findings of dumping early dumping increases with consumption of more food so early dumping is occurring because of hyper or smaller contents hyper or smaller contents will draw fluid into the bowel right will draw fluid and there will be bloating distension there might even be vomiting right so because of this hyperosmolar contents will draw fluid that is what can lead to early dumping and if you increase the consumption of food early dumping will increase this is true features of late dumping manifest 1 to 2 hours after consumption of food so they will start after 45 minutes or so and they can persist for 1 to 2 hours so this is not entirely i mean true so let's go with false here octreotide can be used in patients with severe dumping this is true octreotide does benefit in dumping syndrome 
a man presented to the hospital with a three day history of hematemesis. Upper GI endoscopy reveals multiple gastric polyps and a positive urease breath test. So, you know, urease breath test would be positive in cases of patients with H. pylori. Which type of polyp is most commonly associated with this condition? The most common polyp associated is hyperplastic polyp. So, hyperplastic polyps are the most common gastric polyps which are there and they are associated with H. pylori. If you talk about gastric polyps, you have neoplastic polyps, you have neoplastic polyps which can be adenomas or a fundic gastric polyp. These fundic gastric polyps can even be seen in patients who are taking a lot of PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, you can see these fundic gastral polyps. Non-neoplastic, hyperplastic are the most common which are associated with H. pylori inflammatory and hematomatous polyps are the other ones. So, these are the various polyps, the most common being hyperplastic. This was a question which was asked in the recent FMG exam, which of the following pairs of cancer staging have been matched correctly? Oral cancer, Jackson staging, this is false, Jackson's is for penile cancer, and for oral cancer, you have the TNM staging. Bladder cancer, you have the TNM staging. Testicular cancer, it is TNMS, where S is the value of tumor markers, where S is the value of tumor markers. Breslow and Clark's, you know, Clark's and Breslow are for malignant melanomas are for malignant melanomas. Gastric cancer, Borman is the correct answer. Borman's classification is for gastric cancer. For gastric cancer, you have two classifications. The early gastric cancer classification is known as the Japanese classification and the advanced gastric cancer. Advanced means which invades the muscle layer, which invades the muscle layer, you have the Borman's classification. And another thing which you should know in the Bormann's classification is that type 4, type 4 Bormann's is known as diffusely infiltrative type, is known as diffusely infiltrative type or linitis plastica or linitis plastica appearance. Patients treated for gastric cancer develops a nodule over the umbilicus. What is the likely diagnosis? So, this is likely to be a sister Mary Joseph's nodule. You know, periumbilical metastasis in patients with gastric cancer is known as sister Mary Joseph's nodule. There are other atypical presentations as well, which I will just cover. This is one of them. Identify the sign which is seen in an advanced gastric cancer. This is known as tripe palms. Tripe palms are hyperkeratotic palms. The palms become hyperkeratotic, and that is also a sign of advanced gastric cancer. So, the atypical presentations of gastric and GI cancers you have an Irish nodule. Irish nodule is a left axillary lymph node in advanced gastric cancer, that is Irish nodule. Virchow's node has been asked multiple uh, times. Virchow's node is left supraclavicular lymph node or Troisier sign. This is also seen in advanced GI malignancies. You have migratory thrombophlebitis or Troiseo syndrome. This is most commonly seen with pancreatic cancer. Bloomer's shelf is metastasis into the pouch of Douglas. It is also an advanced sign in any GI cancer. Sister Mary Joseph is periumbilical nodules and Krukenberg's tumor are bilateral ovarian metastases which are seen most commonly seen with gastric cancer. The old school theory for Krukenberg's tumor was transcelomic mets but the latest is retrograde lymphatic mets. These are the atypical presentations. There are two dermatological presentations also which you should know about. They are lesser trilat sign which is multiple seboric keratosis, multiple seboric 
keratosis and sometimes these seborrheic keratosis will also resolve after surgery. So, you will see a dramatic resolution in these seborrheic keratosis after resection of the primary. Tripe palms, I have already told you, are hyperkeratotic palms. So, you should know about these atypical presentations. They are asked occasionally in the exam. An elderly patient is diagnosed with intestinal type of cancer according to the Lawrence classification. There is a printing error here, Lawrence classification. Which of the following is not regarding, not true regarding this condition? So, Lawrence classification divides gastric cancers into intestinal and diffuse type. Intestinal type are associated with gastric atrophy are more well differentiated more common in men and they show hematogenous spread. So, lymphatic spread is the wrong answer here. They show more hematogenous spread. This is the Lorenz classification where you can see intestinal type occur because of gastric atrophy, more common in men, increased incidence with age, hematogenous spread and APC gene mutation is there. Diffuse type is more familial, more common in women younger age group and the classical finding here is signet ring cells and decreased E cadherin is also there in diffuse gastric cancer which can even give rise to your diffusely infiltrative or linitis plastica appearance. According to the Japanese classification for gastric cancer which of the following is level 10 lymph nodes. So, level 10 lymph nodes, the lymph nodes are divided into 16 levels and level 10 lymph nodes are close to the splenic hilum that is level 10. So, level 10 is splenic hilum, 9 is celiac artery. So, you should know the top 10 for these, they have been asked in the exam. If we remove 1 to 6 lymph node stations, it is known as a D1 gastrectomy. It is known as a D1 gastrectomy. And if we remove till 11, then it is known as a D2 gastrectomy. And D2 gastrectomy is optimal gastric lymph node dissection. According to the molecular classification of gastric cancer, which type has the worst prognosis? So, this is a new thing which is given in Bailey as well, the molecular classification of gastric cancer. We have already read about the molecular classification of breast cancers, but there is a molecular classification of gastric cancers as well. The various types are EBV that is Epstein-Barr virus type. My MSI is microsatellite instability, you have CIN and genomic stability, GS is genomic stability and out of this the worst prognosis is of the genomic stability type, is of the genomic stability type that has the worst prognosis here. The best prognosis is of microsatellite instability type, so microsatellite instability, this one has the best prognosis. Which of the following statements is not true regarding gastric volvulus? Gastric volvulus also there have been one or two questions in the last three years. Organoaxial is the most common type. So, organoaxial is the most common type, this is true. Borkat's triad includes upper abdominal pain, retching and inability to pass the Ryle's tube. This has also been asked. Mesentricoaxial is the most common in children. And in mesentrico-axial rotation, greater curvature twists over the lesser curvature. So, let us look at these two gastric volvulus. Organo-axial, the rotation occurs along the line joining the cardia to the pylorus. So, what is going to happen? The greater curvature is going to come over the lesser curvature. So, this is seen in organo-axial, this is false, this is seen in organo-axial and not mesentrico-axial. In mesentrico-axial, the top part of the stomach will come over the lower part of the stomach, that is mesentrico-axial. It has more chronic symptoms and this is seen in children because of congenital defects, whereas organo-axial is the most common type and vascular compromise is more common 
in organoaxial type. So, this was asked in the last INICT and there was a lot of confusion regarding this question. A child has abdominal discomfort and breathlessness. X-ray is shown below. What is the diagnosis? So, you can see here that there is some amount of bowel which has come into the thorax, thorax and it is on the right side. It is on the right side. So, what all can we rule out? It is certainly not eventration of diaphragm. Gastric volvulus, there is no Ryle's tube which you can see. So, one of the findings in Borkat's triad was inability to pass a Ryle's tube that you cannot see here. So, that is out. Bokdelic hernia, which is the more common type of diaphragmatic hernia, is seen on the left side. This one is on the right side. So, the correct answer here is going to be Morgagony hernia. Morgagony is right anteromedial, whereas Bokdelic is left posterolateral. This would be Bokdelic hernia, which is the most common type of congenital diaphragmatic hernia and this is left posterolateral. This one is left posterolateral. Gastric volvulus, this would be gastric volvulus. Again, you have to see that there is inability to insert the Ryle's tube. This is Bocard's triad, retching, epigastric pain and discomfort, inability to pass a Ryle's tube. So, the next question is, what is the standard treatment for an isolated 3 centimeter gist in the body of the stomach, which has not shown features of malignancy? So, gist you know is gastrointestinal stromal tumors. Stomach is the most common site for gastrointestinal stromal tumors. Now, if it is a 3 centimeter gist, you can just do a wedge resection for the gist and if it has not shown features of malignancy, even after the biopsy, if there are no features of malignancy, you do not need to add imatinib. Imatinib is given in malignant gist or if there are metastases, imatinib you know is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Imatinib, you know, is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor which is there. True and false regarding gist, Carney Stratakis syndrome include gastric gist, paraganglionomas and pulmonary chondromas. So, this is Carney's triad, this is false, this is Carney's triad. Pulmonary chondromas are not there in Carney Stratakis syndrome. Carney stratakis is just gastric gist and paraganglionomas, but if it was Carney's triad, then all three things are there. It is a radiological diagnosis. It is diagnosed by CECD. This is true. Location of the tumor is the most important prognostic factor. This is false. It is according to the Fletcher's classification, which takes into account the size and the number of mitotic figures. So, it takes into account the size and the number of mitotic figures. Lymph node clearance is mandatory in all patients with GIST. This is false. Less than 10 percent go to the lymph nodes. Lungs are the most common site for metastasis. This is false. It goes to the liver most commonly. Dodge 1 is the most specific marker. Seed skit or CD117 is the most common marker. These two are true statements which have been asked in the exam. Which of the following is not a component of the obesity, surgery, mortality risk score? The OSMRS, this is a new score which has been added. It is there in the latest Bailey as well. And it basically tells us what is the risk of mortality in a patient who is going to undergo bariatric or obesity surgery. So, the criteria not included is type 2 diabetes mellitus. What is included is hypertension age more than 45, male gender, body mass index more than 50 and the risk of thromboembolism. These five things are included there. So, identify the procedure shown in the image. So, this you can see that there is some kind of a bypass which has been done here. So, it is not biliopancreatic division, it is not a duodenal switch. These two for your information are associated with maximum weight loss. But because there are so many complications with these two procedures that they are no longer done. So, it has to be a Roux-en-Y gastrojejunostomy or a mini gastric bypass. 
Now, Ru and Y gastrojejunosmi, you know that there will be two anastomoses which will be there. But here you can just see a single anastomosis. That is why this is a mini gastric bypass and not a Ru and Y gastrojejunosmi. So, you can see Ru and Y will have two anastomoses, whereas mini gastric bypass has a single anastomosis. This is a mini gastric bypass. Ru and Y is the most acceptable bariatric surgery procedure. This one is biliopancreatic division and this one is duodenal switch. The problem with both of them is that there are a lot of complications in terms of malabsorption. That is why both these procedures are no longer being done. What is being done these days is Ruenvi gastrojejunostomy or sleeve gastrectomy, which is the most commonly done procedure these days. Which of the following is a reversible bariatric surgery procedure? So, reversible bariatric surgery procedure, Ru and Y gastrogenosomy not reversible, sleeve is not reversible, biliopancreatic division is not reversible, gastric banding is reversible. This is the reversible procedure. This is the gastric band which is put 6 centimeters below the GE junction. And if you feel that the patient is losing a lot of weight, you can just deflate the balloon and that would enable the patient to eat again and to gain weight. So, you can adjust the amount of weight loss which you want by doing this procedure. What is the most common cause of death in patients who undergo bariatric surgery? This is again a very important question directly out of Bailey. The answer here is pulmonary embolism. So, the risk of DVT is very high in patients those who are undergoing bariatric surgery and pulmonary embolism is the leading cause of death in these patients. A 45 year old man with a body mass index of more than 45 and diabetes is motivated to undergo bariatric surgery within 20 days. He is put on a liver shrinkage diet. A liver shrinkage diet is a carbohydrate deficient diet. So, it is a high protein diet. You do not give carbohydrates. So, liver shrinkage diet for 2 weeks is what is recommended. But he is not found to be compliant with the diet. What would you advise to this patient? Bariatric surgery and extensive counseling post surgery? No, because these people, those who are not motivated to follow a diet before surgery, very difficult for them to follow it after surgery as well. Liquid diet for one week is false. You need to do a psychological re-evaluation and support group meetings so that he can be motivated enough to follow a diet before and after surgery as well. A lot of patients think that it's just the surgery part and you know they can eat whatever they want after that. That's not the case. They need to maintain a good healthy lifestyle even after the surgery to continue keep losing weight and not to gain weight again. So, there are three scenarios which have been given to us. We have to choose what is the diagnosis. We have a 32 year old fit male after alcohol intake presents to the emergency with retching and bloody vomiting. No previous episodes in the past, right? So, alcoholic male, there is bloody vomiting, retching. This is classical of a Mallory V's tear. You know, a Mallory V tear is a longitudinal tear along the lesser curvature, starts at the GE junction. The left gastric artery is implicated. The left gastric artery is implicated, and this is usually self limiting bleeding. It usually stops after some time. A 72 year old male with painless GI hemorrhage, no episodes in the past. Preliminary endoscopy is essentially normal. So, elderly male with normal endoscopy and the patient is still bleeding. So, this is classical of Dulafoy's lesions. Dulafoy's lesions are like angiodysplasia, which you can see in the colon in elderly patients. Similarly, these Dulafoy's lesions can be small arterial malformations which can bleed in elderly patients and on endoscopy it can appear to be absolutely normal as well. A 31 year old lady with chronic anemia presents with upper GI hemorrhage. There is antral sparing but rest of the mucosa is inflamed. 
rest of the mucosa is inflamed there is antral sparing so this is classical so you can see type a gastritis there is antral sparing and the patient can have autoimmune gastritis and there can be anemia as well so this is going to be f type b gastritis you know is because of h pylori a 34 year old executive presents to the opd with complaints of heartburn and dyspepsia for the last several months he has been prescribed proton pump inhibitors but has got no relief urea breath test is found to be positive so you know urea breath test is positive in h pylori and h pylori will give rise to type b gastritis as i just mentioned a minute back so h pylori gastritis type b antrum is involved and there is increased risk of cancer with type b gastritis type a gastritis fundus is involved there is antral sparing and it is autoimmune, there is atrophy of the parietal cells, achlorhydria and anemia. So, autoimmune, atrophy of parietal cell mass, achlorhydria and anemia are the findings which you see in type A gastritis. This is a classical Mallory V steer which I have told you is seen in alcoholic patients. It starts at the GE junction but can go towards the cardia and the left gastric artery is implicated. It is usually a self-limiting condition. This one is Menetrier's disease. Menetrier's disease is due to TGF alpha tumor growth factor alpha and there is hypertrophy of the gastric mucosal folds. There is hypertrophy of gastric folds. There can be hemorrhage. There can be protein losing enteropathy. There can be protein losing enteropathy in these patients, and these patients can have an increased risk of gastric cancer as well. Gave is gastric antral vascular ectasia. As the name suggests, it's going to occur in the antrum. It is autoimmune. And as compared to Dulafoy's lesions, where arterioles were there, here there are dilated venules. And what you classically see is the watermelon stomach. This question has been asked, and you have to carry out APC, that is argon photocoagulation in these patients that is what is done in these patients you do an argon photocoagulation this was asked in inict which of the following are used to stop variceal bleeding you know a and b are both tubes sengstaken plecimore minnesota and lintons these are three tubes which can be used to temporarily control bleeding i will tell you about them in detail and you will use an endoscope as well Unfortunately, the size of the images shown in INICT was so small that you couldn't have differentiated between a lower GI versus an upper GI scope. So, it was safer to mark all four as the correct answer. So, there are three tubes as I just mentioned. You have the Sengstaken Blakemore tube. The Sengstaken Blakemore tube has two balloons. It has a gastric and it has an esophageal balloon and it has three channels. So, it has a gastric aspiration, it has a gastric balloon channel and it has an esophageal balloon channel. It does not have an esophageal aspiration channel. Minnesota has an esophageal aspiration channel also and it also has two balloons. Linton's has a single gastric balloon. It has a balloon port, it has an irrigation port and it has an aspiration port. So, Linton's has a single balloon whereas Minnesota and Sings take in Blakemore both have two balloons each. Which of the following IV agents is not used in the management of upper GI hemorrhage? So, management of upper GI hemorrhage, we use proton pump inhibitors, we use terlipressin, octreotide is the most commonly used, terlipressin is the best in variceal. But propanolol is not used because propanolol IV propanolol will trigger hypotension and in a patient who is already bleeding, hy hypotension can be counterproductive. So, you do not want hypotension that is why no propanolol in these patients. So, this is the summary of a patient with upper GI hemorrhage, how we manage that. 
I have already told you about the IV agents. If it is a variceal bleed, we have to do early endoscopy and do banding or sclerotherapy. So, upper GI hemorrhage, true and false, gastritis is the most common cause of upper GI hemorrhage. This is false, it is peptic ulcers. Diurnal ulcers bleed more commonly than gastric ulcers. This is true. Majority of malarivy tears can be managed conservatively. This is true. TNF alpha is implicated in the pathogenesis of menetrias. This is false. It is TGF alpha. Menetrias disease can increase the risk of gastric cancer and splenic vein thrombosis can give rise to left sided portal hypertension. This is also known as sinistral portal hypertension. And the management for this is splenectomy. The various scoring systems for upper GI hemorrhage, you have the bleed criteria is one of the scoring systems for upper GI hemorrhage where B is for ongoing bleeding, L is for low systolic blood pressure, E is for elevated prothrombin time, the other E is for erratic mental status and D is for comorbid diseases. This is the forest classification which has also been asked many times. The forest classification is an endoscopic classification which tells us about the risk of re-bleeding. It tells us about the risk of re-bleeding and type class 1A and 1B have high risk of re-bleeding. 2A also has high risk. 2B has intermediate risk and 2C and 3 have low risk of re-bleeding. This is particularly important for the INICT exam. You should at least know that this is the forest classification which is an endoscopic classification. Details you should know if you are preparing for the INICT exam. This is the Rockel scoring system which is another scoring system in patients with upper GI hemorrhage. Glasgow Blatchford scoring is also used in upper GI hemorrhage patients. Which of the following statements regarding the management of variceal upper GI hemorrhage is not true? Early endoscopy should be done after stabilizing the patient. This is absolutely correct. A second attempt of endoscopic management should be done in patients in case of re-bleeding. This is also true. You should give two trials of endoscopic management before you attempt any other intervention. Sengstake and Blakemo tube temporarily controlling hemorrhage has three channels and it has two balloons. So, I have already shown you these three uh, tubes and you know that Sengstake and Blakemo tube has two balloons and three channels. This is true. Linton's tube has four channel and a single balloon. This is false. It has three channels and a single balloon. Linton is the only one which has a single balloon. Others have two balloons each. So, upper GI hemorrhage, variceal, I have already told you about the IV agents. You need to stabilize and do an early endoscopy. Banding is superior to sclerotherapy. For sclerotherapy, the most commonly used is sodium tetradecyl sulfate. The most common agent used is sodium tetradecyl sulfate. If bleeding stops, we monitor these patients for 24 hours and then we discharge them. We discharge them on oral propanolol, which is used as prophylaxis. If the patient re-bleeds, then we give a second trial of endoscopic management. If that also fails, then we will take up the patient for TIPS. TIPS is transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt and temporarily to control the bleeding till then we are going to put in a Sengstake and Blakemore tube. These are the various pressures. These are the hepatic venous portal gradient. HVPG is hepatic venous portal gradient. You require a duplex scan which is the investigation of choice to measure this and 6 to 10 is preclinical sinusoidal portal hypertension. More than 10, your varices will start to form. More than 12, the varices can rupture and they can bleed. There are various shunts which I have just told you. Shunt you will do, you failed two attempts of endoscopic management. A Warren's shunt 
is a splenorenal shunt is a distal splenorenal shunt which is a selective shunt linton's shunt is a proximal splenorenal shunt inokuchi shunt is a left gastric venocaval shunt this one is also selective x fistula is an end to side portocaval shunt and sigvera's procedure is devascularization procedure is esophageal devascularization procedure is known as Sigvira's procedure. So, these are the various shunts which I have just told you. This is TIPS which is transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. This is an example of a non-selective shunt where you can see a shunt has been made between the branch of portal vein and hepatic vein and the most common complication according to the latest Bailey is capsular injury to the liver which can give rise to bleeding. It can also precipitate encephalopathy and most common late complication is blockade of the catheter and once the catheter gets blocked it can give rise to increased pressure there can be increased pressure which can give rise to bleeding, right. So, this is regarding tips, these are the various varices and this is how we manage upper GI hemorrhage. So, in this module we have spoken about stomach, stomach cancers, ulcers and upper GI hemorrhage.